Uh, I'm Jim Cabral from MTG Management Consultants, and it's my pleasure to, to talk to you today about the real cost of standards. Like you guys, I'm here because I believe in the power of using information technology to help support information sharing. And I'd like to start with a clip here from a, from a TV show that I've, been really, that I've been following that I really like called Halt and Catch Fire. And it, kind of, it should help re remind us why, why we are here. I want to set the stage before they actually start this. Uh, Joe McMillan is this hotshot, presumably from IBM, and he's out recruiting from engineers to help him clone the IBM PC. Identify with. How many of you desire to be computer engineers? The relationship between Cameron and Joe is really fascinating. Glad you could join us. Joe sees a lot of what he sees in himself in Cameron. Tell me one thing that will be true about computers 10 years from now. You. He thinks she is brilliant. Computers will be connected together across one network with a standard protocol. Like phone lines? Obviously phone lines. It's really simple. He likes her. What's your name? There's something about her. Cameron. He's never seen before. Cameron how? She sees a vision of what computers are capable of, the same way he sees that vision. Computers could be more. They should be. For Cameron, she's... So Joe's impressed by Cameron's ability to see the future and see that standards and then TCP IP and the internet are going to happen. And but what, should, should he really be that impressed? Should he be really that, uh, is it really that impressive to, to, to say that standards will eventually take hold? Well, if we look at the business case for standardization, it's, it's actually pretty clear. Um, you know, the reasons, the benefit, on the benefit side for standardization, you have things like uh, componentization, which allows us uh, portability, the idea that we can replace a component with something that's, that's similar and comparable uh, later on if we need to. Uh, it also helps us to avoid things like lock-in to a particular solution provider or to a particular solution. You also have scalability. If we're going to scale to something to the level of an entire enterprise or even globally to something like the internet, you have to have standards. And reusability. When we talk about reusability, we often think about planned reuse. So we're designing this service right now because we know we're going to need it later as well. Uh, but what people often forget is the unanticipated reuse. There's reuse by people within your organization as well as people that you never thought of that could, could use that service or that solution. On the cost side, there's some perceptions or I like to say misperceptions about what the real costs of for adopting standards. Uh, there's a perception that in the design stage and the implementation stage that this adds complexity and that ends up in, in adding cost and delay to the project. There's also this idea of this, the problem with standards is there's so many of them, right? And so there's the, there's the problem or the confusion around which standard to, to take, which, which standard to pick. Or if I pick this standard now, am I going to be for, forced to change to something later? And so that whole risk of change is a, is a real concern and a legitimate concern with, with the use of standards. So the, the problem that most people, the trap that pe most people fall into here is they're not really looking at the, at the big picture. They're tending to underestimate reuse, again, within their own or organization and then outside of their organization. They're also not looking at the complete systems development life cycle when they look at these costs and benefits. So let's look at that. If I look at a standard SDLC, at the, during the uh, planning and analysis phases, you've got things like requirements analysis. And those, you can jumpstart your requirements analysis by, by leveraging existing functional standards like we have for the, for the uh, CAD systems today. It also helps you uh, when you're you know, looking at components and alternatives. Uh, if someone has already got a third-party solution that provides the infrastructure that you need for your solution, why rebuild that? Why not leverage that? Why spend all that time focusing on requirements and design when you can just skip that and use something that, that is interoperable through the use of standards? When you get into the design phase, um, you, you, the entire scope of the system can be reduced by the fact that, again, you're, not, you're, you're leveraging components that already exist. Uh, and then when you get to interfaces, uh, you are uh, building interfaces that are designed for reuse. 
Um, and so that simplifies things uh, both in, in a design, a development, and, and, and testing phase. When we get into implementation, all that integration testing that has to happen, you can use standard, standard scripts that have already been produced because there have been standard sets of requirements and standard sets of interface uh, specifications that you're, that you're testing against. So that simplifies that as well. And finally, people often forget about the maintenance phase of, of, a, of a systems development lifecycle. If you've used standards, you've designed in uh, the future. So you've ex designed in extension points that you can leverage in future use of the, of the system and, and, and pr probably prolong the, life, the lifespan of that entire system by building in that, those extension points. So if we look at the entire systems development lifecycle, the use of standards allows you to not have to worry so much about that 80% of, of a standard SDLC that's, that's focused on infrastructure and allows you to really concentrate your effort on that 20% that is truly functional and of use to, to the user. So the other mistake that people often make when they, when they look at the cost of standards is they confuse the cost of the pioneer with the cost of the adopter. And let me give you a little, remind you a little bit of your American history here. So in the, the late 18th century, in the, the Western migration, the Westward expansion, you had people migrating from the East Coast, basically mostly along the coast, into the, uh, the middle of the country. And they had to get over a bunch of mountains. And they had to get through what was truly wilderness at that point. And so companies like the Transylvania Company hired men like Daniel Boone here to cut a road for people. I like this because I'm from Kentucky, and, and he cut a road through Kentucky called the Wilderness Road through Cumberland Gap. And it actually ended up in my home of, of Louisville, Kentucky. But what you need to know here is that because of the work of these guys, within a matter of 40 or 50 years, hundreds of thousands of people literally drove their wagons through this road and settled into the, the middle of the country. And it really created America that we know today. So because of the work of those pioneers, they literally blazed the path for the adopters. It made, it made the cost for the adopters very low and made it very easy for them to go ahead and just use the work of the pioneers. So if we look at the costs in a, in a, a standard development effort uh, for the pioneer versus the adopter, there, there's no comparison. If you look at the development costs, uh, you've got you know, things like they, have, they, have, they need to build a, a modular ar architecture or a framework. And just coming up with that, how the pieces and parts fit together, is a, is a fair amount of effort. There's all, all, obviously the, all the development effort that goes associated with that. Um, and there's uh, a lot of architecture work that has to happen. So there's a lot that goes into the initial development. But that's not all the costs. You have a lot of promotion that needs to happen. Promotion within your organization to, to management groups and governance groups, but then promotion outside of your organization to get your users and uh, external partners to also adopt the similar standards. And finally, if everyone's going to be conforming to the same standards, you need training and certification programs. And we can look at, look at what, what I just has supported through the NEEM training programs and the Springboard Initiative as an example of some of that early adoption, uh, that, uh, that pioneering work. So obviously, significant cost for a pioneer. You have to be a little crazy to be a pioneer. Because from a business perspective, it's sometimes very hard to justify all of those costs. But there's only takes a few pioneers. And once, you have, once they've done that work, the cost to the early, even the early adopters, the first people that jump on the bandwagon, are very low. There's barely, there's barely any development costs, if any. The, there are costs usually associated with the uh, promotion, just because you still have to convince people that this is a good thing. This is, this is the right standard. We've looked at, the, looked at the choices out there. This is the one, right one to use. There's still some promotion work that has to happen. And there is some training and certification programs. But in this, in, in this case, instead of creating the training programs, creating the certification programs, they're basically just subscribing to it and following it. And then if you look at the late adopters, at this point, the standards are baked into the tooling. They're baked into the infrastructure. There's no cost to the late adopter. So it's, again, you have to be a little crazy to be the pioneer, but you, you kind of have to be crazy not to be the early or late adopter. Why not use it? 
And the best part of this is all those benefits I talked about with regard to componentization and reusability and scalability, all of those help the pioneers, late adopters, and early adopters equally. They're all, they all benefit from those same, benef those same benefits. So I want to just give you a few quick case studies here. Uh, I've been very much involved with the electronic court filing uh, uh, standard. And we have some pioneers. Some pioneers are in the room. Jorge and Michael are some of our pioneers. So if you look at states like Georgia and Arizona and Utah, they've been at the table literally for almost a decade now helping to develop these standards. And they've made some significant investments. I think Jorge and I talked about this earlier. And it's, it's about $40,000 or so over a, a year, over nine years. So they've made a significant investment in this. But, the, but they're benefiting from that investment because all these adopters have come in now to also use those same standards that we've developed through OASIS. And now we've got nine states that are out there that have, have adopted ECF as the basis for, uh, for their solutions. And now those same providers that are, that are supporting uh, Jorge and, and, and the Georgia courts are also you, leveraging those same implementation, standards conforming imp implementations in these other states. Let's look at another one. Hopefully, most of us are familiar with GFIPM. Uh, if you look at the early adopters, or the, sorry, the pioneers in this space, again, we've got some of them here in the room, uh, you can look at groups like RIS and Cisnet and JNET, right? They, they did a lot of the work, and GTRI was fundamental to, to that work as well. Uh, and based on, based on the work that they've done in development of that common uh, uh, token and, and uh, federated identity approach, we've now got a number of states that have adopted that as the basis for their federated identity systems in law enforcement, and even some federal partners that have, have adopted that. So the FBI uh, CGIS bridge is, is based on GFIPM. And, uh, and, and now we've, we, we're starting to see the uh, even profiles of what, they've, what we call the National Identity uh, Exchange Federation, the NEF. So this is now seeing uh, broad adoption across a number of states, and this is only going to continue to grow. And I think Ivette is going to talk to you later about this. And then finally, if you look at the NEME, if, who's really the, the pioneers of the NEME? Who really put a lot of the investment into that early, those early days? Well, you really have to give credit to the entire GGXDM community because there were a lot of people involved with the, with the creation of, of the GGXDM originally that the NEME is based on. But if you look at who the, who the adopters are of the NEME, it truly is nationwide. We're seeing it in every state, in, in every jurisdiction. It's popping up on a regular basis now. So we really have to be, we have to give, it, give credit to those people, to those pioneers who did that early work to made what we're all achieving now uh, possible. And I want to give one example. Uh, Bob Kalin is in the room. He, uh, he's uh, uh, a senior partner with MTG and he's been involved with an effort for a number of years in Connecticut. And they looked at uh, ways to do information sharing across all the law enforcement agencies in the state of Connecticut. And there's 169 agencies, 30 different providers. It was going to cost, you know, millions and millions of dollars to build out interfaces to all of those. They adopted a, a single uniform arrest report, mean based, and they got that down to $2 million to, to get all the agencies connected. And so there's this, that's just one example, and that's just one exchange. They've got 46 exchanges they already have planned that they're going to implement, and there's a, there's a list of almost 400 exchanges they could eventually grow to. So you can see how this scales and pays off, pays huge dividends in the long run. So, I'm going to end with the future of standardization. We can all imagine a future where all of this, everything is based on standards, everything is truly plug and play and interoperable. Well, that's a nice future. I don't know if, you know, it's nice to dream, dream about that. But that's, that is what we're going to. And what I'm trying to say is that we're not, the, the future is not, it isn't the future of standardization. What I really mean to say is the future is standardization. You, have, you can look at any industry and over time the standards are going to take over. Um, the lesson learned for the solution providers in the room is you need to embrace those technologies in, as commodity in your infrastructure and then focus higher in the stack, focus on the functionality that really is of use to your, of your users and just adopt the standards lower in the stack. Uh, for, for any of the agencies that might be uh, uh, contracting, 
uh, in the room, you, the lesson learned is you need to hold the vendors accountable and the solution providers accountable and really ask them, require them to conform to those standards. It's going to help you, it's going to help them in the long run.